Hi everybody, welcome to today's virtual field trip. Today we are at a feedlot operation at the Stickle Farm and we will be talking about their, their feedlot operation and you know a little bit about what they do and how their farm works. So uh, Aaron, if you want to go ahead and tell us a little bit about yourself, your family, your operation. Uh, you are virtually tuned in here to Stickle Farms located in central Wood County, uh, right outside of Bowling Green, Ohio. So on this uh, particular operation, we do a multitude of things. Um, we are extremely diversified and you know, diversification can mean a lot of things to a lot of different people and a lot of different operations. Um, but here on our farm, every piece of the puzzle, everything that we do impacts another portion of our business. And so um, we are, like I said, a diversified operation where we grow uh, row crops. So you're, your number two yellow corn, non-GMO soybeans, uh, wheat. We also grow hay, and with the wheat and hay, we have a hay and straw business. Then we raise cattle, and we also raise processing tomatoes. Uh, the family has been a, a grower for a, a local business in processing tomatoes for uh, over 45 years, and um, that's something that really is a, a huge impact to our operation. And um, like I said, every piece of the puzzle plays into one another. So today we're gonna obviously specifically talking about our beef cattle operation. And uh, I'm standing out here in uh, the, the only pasture that we have here um, for, our, for our business. So uh, this like 22 acre plot is uh, what we have for our girls to, to get out and uh, run around on for uh, just a few months out of the year. As you guys know, most of you are from Ohio, probably all of you. and um, you know, the weather in Ohio can be quite volatile. So this spring, we had a very wet spring. We had a okay-ish summer. And then it's been raining here for the last off and on. Um, we finally got some rain uh, when we were a little bit dry. So pasture ground and the ability for cows to get out and, uh, and have a lot of space to roam in this particular region of, of the world is, is not all that vast. And so um, our girls have this, this particular area accessible to them. Um, a few months out of the year, but otherwise they actually are what we call dry lotted. And so they live in a, um, in a lot where they get fed every single day, um, a, a mixed ration of uh, hay, um, other protein and energy sources, and um, have access to, to clean water um, at all times. So um, they're really happy today because we're just a beautiful fall morning here in Northwest Ohio. And uh, we're giving them a little extra treat with a little extra hay and corn to kind of get them to pose for the video. So um, they're quite pleased and uh, they're not, you don't even hear them bellering or any sort of, uh, any sort of issues on that front. But um, we have about 40 beef cows, mostly of the Red Angus influence, um, but all of them are commercial. None of our cattle are, um, are registered. And that's just something that we've chosen for our operation. There's lots of folks in Ohio um, that raise pure, that are, have purebred operations, but we consider ourselves a, uh, exclusively commercial operation uh, for the purpose of raising beef cattle uh, for the supply chain uh, in the commercial industry. So um, we'll we'll talk about the cows here for just a, just a minute, and then we're going to head into our feedlot and uh, discuss kind of more of the life cycle and uh, the the beef cattle supply chain here as we move forward. I guess I should introduce myself here briefly. Uh, my name is Aaron Stickle. My husband Andy um, and his brother Brian are the the managers and partners in Stickle Farms Incorporated. And uh, Andy and I have been married for a number of years. We have four kids, um, ages from 13, 10, two and three. So we've got a lot of, uh, lot of little ones to manage as, lot of, lot, as well as a lot of critters out here. Um, and so, you know, I was raised in the agricultural industry. My, my grandparents were farmers on both sides. And then uh, my dad uh, was a hog farmer and raised sheep. Um, he now works in the ag sector and, and ag business, um, but agriculture has always been a passion of mine. So uh, when Andy and I got married, we knew we wanted the community to grow and develop the operation where he was already working and he has the ability and um, to, to farm full time. So uh, we're extremely blessed by that. And um, it's a way of life that we love. We are so happy that we get to raise our family in this type of environment. And um, I actually have an off the farm job. I've been in the ag sector for a number of years, but I've recently started at an endeavor as a financial advisor. And uh, what that does is it allows us to be a little bit more financially less dependent on agriculture. Now, 
we love it. <laughs> All of our money goes to the ag sector. Um, but with my ability to work off the farm and provide for our family in a little bit of a different way um, allows us to be, you know, uh, a little bit less dependent on the commodity markets, a little bit less dependent on foreign trade. Now, while all those things do link together, um, using my ability and my resources and my skill sets to do, you know, marketing, whether it's a virtual field trip or to work with clients and help them there to develop their financial plan for their families um, is something that uh, I'm extremely proud of and something I'm very passionate about. So, um, yeah, lots of things going on in our life, but such is the life of any farmer and uh, beef cattle producer um, in the U.S. So happy to be here with you today. Uh, Cagney, I'll let you kind of tee a few things up and we kind of dive a little bit deeper into some topics here. Yeah, so one quick question here is how do you guys breed your cow-calf operation? How many numbers do you have in your cow-calf? Here at Stickle Farms on our cow-calf operation, uh, we have about 40 cows uh, on a regular basis. That number may flux three to five, depending on the year and the age of the cows. But on our operation, all of our cattle are bred naturally. Um, we, we have a lot of friends in the industry who utilize a significant amount of artificial insemination so that they can choose their genetic uh, profiles and uh, the values that they want for their operation. But for us, because we are an exclusively commercial operation, uh, we choose our bulls uh, based on, you know, their numbers and their phenotypic traits. Uh, but then we go ahead and know that they're going to work on on our cow base. And so um, we choose that because, like I mentioned in the beginning of our discussion, we are an extremely diversified operation. And so we just frankly don't have time to sink cows and to worry about getting them bred just at the right time in that, that short time frame that you have to make sure when you are AIing that uh, that semen is uh, implanted at the exact right time. So we choose to naturally breed ours. And with that, we actually can have calves all year round. Um, we, we tend to try to have them calve um, in the winter, February to March timeframe. Um, but every now and then there'll be a cow that may miss a cycle and we may end up with a calf in July. So um, that's just us. And it, it may sound like it's not very organized, which um, but it works for us. And th at that point, it allows us to have calves available year round for mm -hmm. our uh, freezer beef business. And uh, while we have cattle in the feedlot all year round, they are typically all the same size. And so by having calves throughout the year, we are able to provide for our customers here in a local, um, our customers locally for their uh, freezer meat needs. All right, and a question came in. Do you get cattle from other operations to feed out in your feedlot? Yeah, and we'll dive into that a little bit, but we do um, get cattle from other operations um, for our feedlot. Obviously, we only have 40 cows and we're feeding over 400 head a year. So we partner with um, producers all throughout the, the U.S., um, primarily actually out of the, the southeast is where a lot of our cattle come from. Um, and they come in about 600 to 800 pounds and then we feed them out. So um, what you're looking at right now, these are our, our beef cows and kind of filtered it in throughout here. I don't know, Michaela, if we walk over here, there's a few calves over here by themselves. Um, these are our beef cows, but then um, and most of these girls are between two, three, four, five years of age, just depending, but most of them are on the younger side, between two and three years old. And then um, they will calve, their calves will live with them until they're about uh, four to six months old depending on you know how they're growing and where we are in the year with our production cycle and then those those calves will then get transferred into the feedlot operation so um, the cows all live together on a on a regular basis but then the calves will get weaned and uh, we will then feed them out so they can uh, enter enter the supply chain so you'll also see I don't know where he is right now but we uh, our bull runs with our our cows most of the year, like I mentioned. So it allows us to, to have calves throughout the year, even though uh, as the cows live together, they tend to cycle at the same time. So he's able to cover a, a good number of the, of the girls, um, you know, at the right time throughout the year, so. All right. I noticed that there are these yellow things in their ears. Can you hit on a little bit about ear tags and how you 
You bet. So these cows are all identified. There may, I can't say all of them because there may be a few that have slipped an ear tag here or there, but our cows are all identified uh, by their ear tags. So the nice earrings that they have hanging out of their ears are their in individual identification numbers. And it's super important that we know which cow is which so we can identify when they have a calf. We can identify um, if she's sick. We know which one we need to treat and when she was treated. Uh, record keeping is, is, is an extremely important part of uh, any livestock operation, but especially uh, when, you're, when you're raising meat animals for the supply chain, um, it's super important that you know who their mom is and uh, you know, who their dad is and all of those things. So that way, um, if there is a problem, we can track that back to their original, uh, their original gene pool. There's the big guy. Perfect. All right. Now, do you want to dive in a little bit about the life cycle? From the time the cows are born to when they hit, enter the food chain. So from a life cycle standpoint, uh, the calves are born. They live with their moms for about four to six months um, until they're about 600 to 800 pounds. Now, every operation is different. I'm specifically speaking to a generality type standpoint and what we do on our operation. So the calves are born and then they live with uh, their moms for four to six months, are weaned between you know, 400 to 800 pounds, depending on uh, how they're growing and how their mother's milk and all of those things. Um, and those are all super critical parts to the animal selection and um, utilizing our resources here for our operation in a very sustainable and economical way. Um, so from a life cycle standpoint, after the calves are weaned, then they get moved into the feedlot. And uh, I don't know, do you guys want to head over there? Does that sound like something we should do right now? We can kind of talk yeah, a little bit deeper great. about that. Okay. So maybe while we're talking, I'll just kind of talk a little bit about our operation and um, some of the things that we do to maintain sustainability, uh, manage water quality, and all of those things. So here at Sickle Farms, we're located, like I already mentioned, in central Wood County, literally just about 30 miles from Lake Erie. And with that, all of our waterways that surround this particular farm, be it the ditches that collect water or creeks or even uh, the mommy which all feed into the Maumee River, all of those pieces of the puzzle um, then supply Lake Erie. And anybody who's from Ohio knows that we've had a bit of a, an issue here with Lake Erie and water quality. And we, we just try to do the best on our farm to maintain that the production practices that we're utilizing, as well as our manure management, and even from a livestock feed standpoint, that we're being extremely resourceful and um, maintaining practices that help all those pieces. So um, out here, this is just actually a hay field. And uh, we just converted this ground to hay because we know that we need to continue to be able to make our own feed, to have resources available for not only the cow-calf operation, but the feedlot. And that's just a huge piece for us from a sustainability standpoint. I kind of talked about our diversification a little bit um, earlier. And with that, so we do grow corn. The corn is used for feed. Uh, the feed is used for the cattle. The, the cattle produce manure and the manure then goes back onto the, the row crops. So you can see the whole big cycle from a uh, production standpoint uh, that is super, super important for this, this particular farm. And being very cognizant of uh, manure, the, the amount of manure that is applied helps us to be able to use less commercial, commercial fertilizer. It allows us to be um, very specific about the cover crops that we choose to put on our fields and then as well as it helps our crop rotation and the crop rotation is actually probably the most important part to the diversification because it allows us to utilize those cover crops spread manure at times of the year when we don't when we can't do other things like harvest is already done and we're waiting to plant um, so by growing a growing crop we are then able to really um, get out and you know, manage our farm, but also take what the cattle are, have given us uh, from a, a fertilizer and nutrient standpoint and utilize that back onto uh, the other products that are part of our operation. So we've kind of moved in here to our feedlot. We're actually not full right now. Um, right now there's just about 200 head of cattle in here, not uh, about 200 head. 
Mexican. And um, the, like, these cattle are all weighing about a f between 900 and 1,000 pounds. So these guys have been in here for about three weeks now, if my calendar is correct. And um, so like we were talking a little bit earlier about where we get our livestock, these cattle are sourced from other breeders. Uh, this group actually came out of North Carolina. And so it's great to be able to work with other uh, beef cattle producers throughout the country for our, for our needs. And then we can feed, feed them out um, until they're about 1,300 pounds. So in about another four months or so, these guys will be ready to go to harvest and then enter the supply chain. So from a life cycle standpoint, we saw the little calves out in the pasture. We saw the big mama cows out in the pasture. Um, and most of you probably have an idea if you're in an ag classroom, the difference between a bull and a cow and a cat uh, and a steer and a heifer. But in this feedlot, you'll see a mix of both steers, which are castrated males, as well as heifers. So females that have not had a calf. And um, we don't really discriminate uh, here on our operation. We don't mind feeding heifers. They just tend to get to a, a finishing standpoint at a little bit of a earlier, earlier time frame. Um, and so just about management at that point and knowing which ones are ready for harvest um, at different times. And you'll see this group's maybe just a little bit skittish yet because um, they've only been here a little bit of time, but we're out in these cattle every single day. Um, so they will get to know us and they will become a little bit more friendly as they get older. Um, but once these cattle reach about 1,300 pounds, 1,350 pounds, they'll be ready for harvest. And we know that by evaluating them. So my husband, Andy, actually has a master's degree in meat science. Um, his brother, Brian, is, grew up on the operation and knows you know, what to look for. Um, I myself, I was on livestock judging teams, grew up, on, um, grew up in agriculture, showing in 4-H and FFA. And so we all have a very good understanding of meat animal quality, as well as phenotypic traits that are important for a high quality eating experience. Uh, obviously the genet genetics do play a really big portion, a really big piece of that puzzle. Um, so we try to evaluate for what we know, what we can see from a phenotypic standpoint, um, if those cattle are ready for, for market or not. Um, so. Yeah, perfect. All right, and now can you tell us a little bit about the difference between a cow-calf operation and a feedlot operation? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, like I mentioned, these cattle came out of North Carolina. That particular producer, and we have a, a bunch of cow-calf producers throughout Ohio as well, um, but the particular producer where we, we um, source these cattle, he's a cow-calf producer. So he has a bunch of mama cows, kind of like we saw the girls eating outside, bunch of mama cows, those cows have calves, and then at about 400 to 600 pounds, he weans those calves, and then we go ahead and source them for our feedlot operation. Now, uh, Ohio is very different than states elsewhere, where you have massive, massive open lot feed yards um, that are just an incredible sight. And I know many people who work in the feedlot industry out west, and um, their, their situations are very different. We're Ohio, like I mentioned before, about our weather volatility, our lack of pasture and rangeland, and even some of the economic um, uh, hurdles that we have here in our particular region. Um, utilizing a facility like ours where it has a roof, it has curtains that go down so we can control the climate in the building, um, allows us to raise cattle all year round while, um, while providing them a very safe, um, and secure environment so we can monitor sickness, we can monitor um, growing behaviors and things like that. So um, Cagney, I think I got off track on what your original question was, but uh, the point of that conversation was, uh, so the cow-calf, there we go, I got it. Cow-calf, um, they, they just raise the calves and then they will typically sell the, cat, the calves to a feedlot operation. And feedlot, we are just feeding them out. So we are getting them in at between um, 400 to 600 pounds, to 800 pounds, depending on um, the, the actually depending on the price, frankly, because economics are a huge piece of the puzzle of what we have to determine here. And then we'll feed them out um, for four to six months until they reach about 1,350 pounds. 
and again, I, this goes back to the evaluation conversation that I was just having about kind of knowing when they're ready. Um, we don't have a scale here. We don't run them across the scale, kind of like some of you who maybe show in 4-H and FFA, you're weighing those steers every day, knowing you know, what their rate of gain is. But because we have been doing this for an extremely long time, we know the total pounds that we put into the ration are gonna equate to total pounds per day of gain for these cattle. And um, so about 1,350 pounds, we'll feed them out and then they will go and be harvested and enter the food supply chain. All right, great. So a question coming in is, how many do you guys feed out a year? So here on our particular operation, we're feeding about 400 head of cattle a year. Um, this particular building can hold about 275 head and we'll turn this about one time. Now, I know that, I know that math doesn't necessarily add up, but it just depends on the cycle of cattle that we come in and how many we can buy in a particular unit, um, as well as, frankly, again, back to the financial standpoint, the economics behind the cattle that we buy, the price of what, it, uh, what the market is when it goes out. And here on our operation, we actually, um, we actually raise cattle for a program, uh, an all natural program. And uh, I'll kind of dig into that here in a minute, but the price is super important. And um, I have a background in commodity merchandising and uh, Andy and Brian, of course, have, you know, managed this business for quite some time. So we all keep an eye on the markets. We all have an idea of what our bottom, no, not an idea. We know what our bottom line is. And so we know that economically, sometimes it doesn't make sense to purchase a load of cattle because we know we're not going to be able to lock in a price on the other side that's going to be of a uh, be an impact to this business and so at the end of the day we love feeding cattle we love raising livestock but if it's not economical you know no one's there are very few people in this world who are going to have a business that is not going to make money uh, so it's it's one of those things where it's really hard to balance um, balance that so at about 400 head a year we're feeding and um, we manage that with uh, our partners um, through an all-natural program so what does that mean? Because I hear things all the time that says hormone free, all natural, locally raised, all those things, right? And that, that's fine because those are all buzzwords and those are all things that our consumers are demanding. Um, but here on our operation, we are an all natural feedlot, meaning none of the cattle that come in have been implanted, nor have they been treated for any other uh, illnesses or diseases. So these cattle, uh, by not having implanted, strictly means that they just have not been given that extra little boost that an implant will give um, a calf. And cattle that have been implanted, the eating experience is exactly the same. Um, those cattle have very, there's a very little difference between cattle that have been implanted and those that haven't um, from a hormone standpoint in the beef. And then also, um, but, but that's just what our consumer is demanding. So that's what we're choosing to do. We do receive a premium for this particular program. And that's why it works for us because if it wasn't economical and it wasn't making us just that much more money, we wouldn't do it. But when a calf is sick and a calf does have an issue, we treat that because just like a human, uh, we don't, if, if you're sick, you go to the doctor, you get a vaccine, you get a, an antibiotic, whatever it may be to offset the risk of that disease taking over your body or that virus taking over your body. So same thing in, in this livestock operation. Uh, if a calf is sick, we do treat it, but then that calf can no longer be a part of the all natural program. So typically what happens then is we, um, we then source that cattle for our own selves and uh, use that for freezer meat for us. And um, luckily we don't have a lot of issues around here, knock on wood. Um, and so because we are in this particular facility, we, are very, we can very easily track and manage uh, animal health. Great. Just like, you know, you say you give them antibiotics and give them shots, how do you guys handle the withdrawal time? Maybe hit a little bit on that and how there is a withdrawal time when you give an animal a shot antibiotic that they cannot enter the food chain unless that antibiotic, they are ready to be free. Yeah, you touched on it, Cagney. That's, that's a good point to make. So anytime an animal is given a shot, whether it be an antibiotic or a... Um, or medicine, vaccine of any sort, there is a specific withdrawal time, meaning research has been done on the amount of time it takes for that substance to exit that animal's bloodstream. And whether it's a 10-day withdrawal time, 
30 day withdrawal time, that animal, once it is given that shot, it has to have that many more days until, on feed until that animal can be harvested. There are zero animals enter the supply chain that have any sort of um, medicine uh, residual left in their bloodstream. So consumers can be, can be very, um, consumers can be happy in the fact that they know that any animal that enters the supply chain has not been, is free of any medication or foreign substance. Yes, great. That's a big problem that producers keep an eye on. Uh, now, Ann, let's go in a little bit about what they eat every day. How many times do you guys feed them? You know, why they eat hay? Sure. No, that's a great question. So, the, like we've talked about, we're, okay, Erin, you keep saying that you feed these animals until they're 1,300 pounds. Well, how do they get there? Well, that's, that's a pretty good question. So, here on our farm, uh, we're mixing feed twice a day. And um, actually, let's, I don't want to step on the, on the feed stuff. So, um, we're mixing feed twice a day. And we, we produce what we call a total mix ration. So, these animals um, are given a balanced diet of hay, uh, distiller's grains, corn, uh, protein, energy, forages, fiber, just like a human. And we work really, really hard with a person who has studied and has uh, spent a lot of time in college understanding animal nutrition and ruminant health. Ooh, there's a fun name. There's a fun word. How many of you know what a ruminant is? So a ruminant is an animal that has four compartments to their stomach. Four compartments being the omasum, abomasum, rumen, and reticulum. Okay, so all of those pieces of that animal stomach do a really, really good job of breaking down, um, breaking down feedstuffs. And we like to say that cattle are literally the best environmentalists there could ever be because they can take uh, substances, whether it be in rangeland or in a feedlot situation, and break that down into a digestible product that then produces manure, which goes back to fertilizes the soil. Um, so cattle are really, really cool in that regard. And um, so we mix feed twice a day because these cattle are in a, in a housing situation, and they then have access to feed all, all day long. So you can kind of see here on this bunk, uh, we, we put the feed out, with our feed mixer, and then they come at their leisure. We, you will note that uh, probably five, six, seven times a day, if you're standing out here all day long, the same calf will come up that many times uh, to eat. So cattle eat between 20 to 25 pounds of feed a day, uh, depending on what their total mix ration and what their nutritionist calls for. Um, but one really cool thing is that we utilize a lot of co-products and byproducts of other processes here on our farm. So I mentioned the stiller's grains. So that is actually the co-product of the ethanol process. So everybody's aware of what ethanol, ethanol is a biofuel um, that is used through the production of corn and corn then is broken down to create this fuel that helps fuel um, things, you know, vehicles or um, other items in the industry or in the economy, and then um, we are able to utilize that co-product, the, the residual of what's left over after that process in our feed ingredients. It's a really high protein source and a really high energy source for our livestock. Something else we've started utilizing uh, because it just became available and uh, a, something that we thought we'd wanna try is actually the co-product of a bakery process. So things like donuts, uh, breads, um, pastas, those products that don't make the cut, if you will, um, in their production processes, we are then able to utilize as cattle feed. They're a super high energy source, really good in protein, and they're really easily digestible. And all of those things are, it's, and that's amazing, right? Think about where that would be going otherwise. That'd be going into the landfill, that'd be going into just other, other things where cattle are able to utilize those co-products and then digest them and create fertilizer that goes back to the earth. They're just, cattle are just amazing, amazing resources to this land. So um, that's a little bit about our feedstuffs and there's a lot of operations that have the same ability to utilize products like we do. And that's, that's kind of part of the way how we keep our costs down um, because we are feeding 
feeding cattle every single day, um, you know, that's a really high part of what our inputs are into this operation, a really large part of what our input in, inputs are to this operation. And so we have to keep our feed costs down. And by producing our own hay, by mixing our own feed, by uh, sourcing corn screenings, which are residual from um, facilities here in Toledo, loading boats and train cars, um, we're able to utilize a lot of the products like distillers and bakery for our cattle feed. And it's still a super high nutrition, highly nutritious diet for these cattle. So um, really, really cool thing. And um, that, that's part of how we're able to sustain this operation. All right. You know, yeah, I heard you use the word manure. And now if you want to talk a little bit about how you guys handle that in your manure and with the water quality. Yeah, great question. So that's actually a huge piece of our uh, management here on this farm. So because we feed over 400 head a year, we've created a lot of manure. And uh, we have a manure management plan that we create with our local soil and water district. And uh, all of our manure, because we are in this particular region of Ohio, we can only spread manure a couple times a year. So we actually have a manure storage facility um, that we, we house manure as we scrape the lot. And you can kind of see that, uh, you know, down back in the, in the back part of the feedlot, these cattle live on really dry pack manure. Um, and then that'll get cleaned out two or three times a month. And so we, we store the manure until we're able to haul it and spread it on a growing crop. And then um, we manage that. We know, we get that manure tested to know what the profile of that manure is. You know, how high in nitrogen, how high in phosphorus, all of the, the key elements to know what farms we need to spread manure on, where we're lacking from a soil management standpoint. And then we're able to go ahead and spread the manure um, as needed. So we're not just out there spreading it all over everything because we think that's what it needs. No, we do a lot of testing, a lot of back to that record keeping concept. A lot of those pieces are super important to our overall uh, production. And because we are in such high stress, um, high volatility from a water quality standpoint, utilizing manure is a very critical piece to maintaining soil health for us as well as water, healthy water rays and, uh, and healthy crops at the end of the day. So um, manure is a key part to our operation. We use far less, we use over 80% less commercial fertilizer than we did four years ago, um, just by purely the use of utilizing manure in a more impactful, sustainable, efficient way. Great. That, I think that just goes to show how important the environment is to all the farmers and how serious they take the water quality issue that's going on. So another the question that we have here is a little bit about what your operation does on terms of biosecurity. So biosecurity is also an extremely, uh, extremely important part of uh, our business because these animals are all entering the food supply chain. And even if they weren't, biosecurity is still a huge, huge piece of the puzzle. And because we live in a, I'm going to say rural area, but not nearly as rural as a lot of our other friends throughout Ohio who raise beef cattle. Um, we have, we have metropolitan areas, literally just seven miles on either side of this, this business. So biosecurity is extremely important. And um, for us, any animal that enters this operation is, is quarantined for a few days to make sure that they do not bring any um, any other type of uh, diseases or anything onto our farm. Any person that enters our farm is asked to disinfect their shoes um, and they are able to, uh, and that's super important because, you know, whether you think about it or not, think about every time you walk into the tractor supply company or, or Walmart even, other people are bringing where their houses and where they just came from into those facilities. So we make sure that we change our shoes every single time we step out of our vehicle to come out to the farm or out to the feedlot and um, ask our visitors to do the same. Um, so that's just a sheer human standpoint. Also washing your hands. I know that sounds super basic and everybody's like, man, why are these signs all over the buildings and you know, all of those things. But truly an employee wash your hands before you go back to work is the same thing as it is at, at Taco Bell as it is at, here at Sickle Farm. So all of those pieces are extremely important part of the puzzle for us on our operation. 
Great. And as Aaron has been talking all morning, you heard her say a little bit about the word sustain or sustainability. And I think that's a big word that consumers hear all the time now is that operations want to be sustainable. Every farming operation there is, they want to be sustainable. They want to be able to have that, uh, make sure that there's enough of what's going on that they're taking care of the environment, their land, their cattle for the next generation to come. So, yes. Peggy, that's, that's, that's literally like the only reason we're doing what we're doing. Other than we love it and it's a generational thing and, you know, to get out of ag would just be tragic for us. But um, providing a wholesome, healthy, nutritious food for consumers uh, throughout the world is so important to us. And doing that in a fashion that helps maintain the land, uh, the, the animals, the air and the water quality, are all critical pieces to our sustainability as an operation so that we can continue on for generations to come. Yes, you're exactly right. Producers are producing a safe, nutritious, nutritious beef while balancing environmental stewardship, social responsibility, and economic, economic viability. It's so important for all of our farmers and producers to be this to, so we, we, we can produce food for everybody. You bet. Well, thank you guys so much for coming today. Um, if you have any questions, we are an open book here, uh, which is why we believe in doing these types of things. So feel free to shoot, a, shoot us an email or shoot the, the team an email and they'll be sure to get it to us. We'd love to talk with you again. If you have any other questions, uh, again, do not hesitate to reach out. We appreciate your time today and uh, make sure that beef is what's for dinner. <laughs> Thank you so much, Erin. Thank you for sharing your passion and your operation with us today. If, thank you guys for signing up for a virtual field trip. If you guys have any other questions or like any other resources for your classroom, feel free to reach out to us and we can help you out in any way. Thanks, guys.